Here's the takeaway from our recent sessions. Elements are of three types. An act or series of acts, the conduct element. Attendant circumstances, a result of conduct. Not all criminal offenses involve a result element or attendant circumstance elements. But the elements of an offense must include some act that is both culpable and voluntary. Our investigation of the act requirement is now complete. Oh wait, we've left something out. We need to talk about omissions, that is, failures to act. The case of Jones versus United States is a tragic example. The defendant Jones allowed an infant to starve to death in her house. The infant was another woman's child. The defendant was charged and convicted of a homicide offense. On appeal, Jones's conviction is reversed. The appellate court holds that it was error for the trial court to refuse to charge the jury that it needed to find that the defendant had a legal duty to act. A failure to act can, in certain narrow circumstances, constitute a crime. The typical homicide case consists of an act that causes a resulting death. The Jones case is not typical. Jones did not beat the child to death with a frying pan or smother the child. The defendant did nothing to hurt the child. But the defendant did nothing to help the child either. Either harming or failing to prevent harm can be the cause of a result. When a defendant's actions harm someone, it usually goes without saying that the defendant had a legal duty not to act harmfully. But when a defendant's failure to act kills someone, the prosecution has the burden of showing that the defendant had a legal duty to act. We ignore people in distress on an everyday basis. Millions die every year while we do nothing. Of course, we only have general knowledge of the starvation and distress going on in the world. We wouldn't ignore it if it were going on under our noses, as these two well-fed gentlemen seem to be doing. Or would we? Is it a crime to just walk on by? It is settled doctrine that we have a duty to act to help others only in certain special circumstances. The flip side of that is, generally speaking, we are legally free to ignore the obvious suffering of others even when we could easily save them from death at no cost to ourselves. We have no legal duty to be the Good Samaritan. The exceptional cases fall into four categories. A statute might impose a legal duty to act. The defendant may have a contractual duty to act. The defendant may be related to the victim in a way that the law recognizes as giving rise to a duty to act. Or the defendant may have undertaken to act on behalf of the victim in such a way that left the victim unlikely to be aided by others. Drilling down, we ask, what are these relationships? Well, a parent owes a duty to act to a minor child. Husband and wife owe duties of aid to each other. A master owes a duty to assist an apprentice in avoiding harm. Ship's master has a duty to crew and passengers. An innkeeper has a duty to help a drunken customer avoid harm. What about cohabitants? No, cohabitants do not owe each other a duty of aid. What about parents to adult children? Not a recognized kind of relationship giving rise to a legal duty of assistance. What about adult children to their parents? Well, the law is still evolving, but as of today, 
there is no relationship giving rise to a duty to assist. Siblings? Nope. Step parents to minors? Well, People versus Carroll, a case on page 246, shows us that the, the law is still evolving, but these settled, recognized relationships tend to provide the outer limit of the legal duty to aid insofar as it arises from a relationship. The model penal code provision on the act requirement adds, it reads, a person is not guilty of an offense unless his liability is based on conduct which includes a voluntary act or the omission to perform an act of which he is physically capable. The limitation set out in cases like Jones is condensed in the following way. Liability for the commission of an offense may not be based on an omission unaccompanied by action unless the omission is expressly made sufficient by the law defining the offense or a duty to perform the omitted act is otherwise imposed by law. So there is no legal duty to act absent some law that affirmatively so states. So in a jurisdiction that had adopted or follows this provision of the model penal code, its judicial precedents and its statutory law will determine whether or not there is criminal liability for omissions. But the model penal code goes further and directs courts to look not only to statutes, traditionally recognized relationships and contract, but also to tort law. You will recall from torts, or you will soon learn in torts, the basic rule is that an actor ordinarily has a duty to exercise reasonable care when the actor's conduct creates a risk of physical harm. Creates a risk. A duty of reasonable care is triggered by risk-creating conduct. In other words, if your conduct creates a risk that someone will come to harm, you have a duty to take reasonable affirmative steps to prevent that harm. Consider this case. This man, call him Mr. A, is going to drown unless someone rescues him. You glide by Mr. A in your yacht. You see him, you see that he will drown unless you throw him afloat but you don't want to get involved. He's no relation of yours. He hasn't fallen off of your boat. There's no Good Samaritan statute in the jurisdiction. You face no criminal or tort liability if you ignore Mr. A. You may even, if you wish, drop anchor and watch him drown as you sip champagne and dance the hornpipe. You may even call him a loser as he goes down for the third time. You would never do that, you're too good a person, and in a hurry besides. Now, as you go gliding by, you hear a loud thump. You look and see that your boat has struck Ms. B, a scuba diver, as she was surfacing. She is unconscious and will drown unless you rescue her. Must you? Under the model penal code, you may ignore A, but... If you realize you've struck B, you have a duty to aid. What's the difference? The difference is that your conduct created a risk of harm to Ms. B, while it did not create a risk of harm to Mr. A. Mr. A was already in trouble, no thanks to you. Ms. B was not. The restatement second of torts lays this out in careful, wordy detail. If the actor doesn't act and subsequently should realize that it has created an unreasonable risk of causing physical harm to another, he is under a duty of reasonable care to prevent the risk from taking effect. Moreover, the rule stated above applies even though at the time of the act the actor has no reason to believe that it will involve such risk. And the Model Penal Code will recognize this duty for purposes of criminal law as a duty imposed by law. Consider another fanciful case. 
A, B, and D are standing next to a pond in a public park. None are related to another in any relevant way. Another unrelated person, C, comes along jogging. Let's stipulate that C is exercising due care. C accidentally bumps into B, who is knocked against A. A falls into the pond and begins to drown. A cannot swim. Who of B, C, and D has a duty to rescue A? It would be easy. D does not. D is a mere bystander. B does not. B has not created any risk by his conduct. C's conduct created the risk. Therefore, C has a duty of reasonable care to prevent A's drowning. B and D need do nothing. C does, even though he was no more at fault than B or D. If you, as a public citizen having a special responsibility for the quality of justice, don't like this result, what are you going to do about it?